Hey guys, Daniel and Dennis uh, back today, and we're going to discuss OpenAI Dev Day, Fall 2024, and some of the things that were covered. So, Dennis, start us off. What did they talk about? What's new? Anything groundbreaking? So, there are four major releases as part of the San Francisco Dev Day. They're actually doing three different ones in SF, London, and Singapore. So, what we have here is that there are four major announcements the real time API, the vision fine tuning API, prompt caching, and distillation. Okay, cool. Let's dive into the real-time API. Um, that seemed like the most exciting one. I know they unveiled a new kind of speech-to-speech -speech model. Mm -hmm. um, so can you explain what that's about, what the real-time API is about, and like why that mattered? If we remember the initial demo back in the spring, we saw that you could talk to your phone right, with voice mode. There was some you know, it's called drama right, with it not being released right away. We got it a few weeks ago, actually, right, with uh, the update for everybody. Now, the real-time API is this implementation, but as an API, so nice. as a developer, you can send audio and text at the same time and get a live uh, audio response back from GPT-40. Okay, so how is this different from their speech models or working with other kind of like speech to text technologies like DeepGram or mm -hmm. any others? So generally the architecture that most companies have used is first there's some speech that comes in. It goes through an ASR model. Uh, OpenAI's version of that is Whisper. It would then get translated into text. You do some kind of operations on the text, and then you'd have to use a TTS model, a text-to-speech model, to then render it, whether it's something like Eleven Labs or Cartesia or uh, even some of the OpenAI voices. Mm -hmm. so. And so, so there's three steps in, the, in a traditional process. Yes. It's convert to text, process the text, and then yes. go text it back to speech. Yes. So how is this different? So this is different that you just send a request in, and you can get some audio back. Okay. Uh, the nice thing, actually, is that there's a lot of different events and customizations that you can do. But when you're sending uh, something in, you're sending just the audio file. Just the aud audio file. You're sending, uh, if we get a little bit more technical, you can open up a web socket. So you can mm. send sort of a continuous stream of audio data. Oh, cool. Okay, so it's not like it's sending a whole MP3 recording. It's like doing this uh, over a period of time. Yes. Okay. So they actually give you some code. Uh, but basically, if you, if you look at the code, you uh, call their API sort of in a standard way. But you'll just have to pre-process uh, the audio okay. uh, into an audio buffer. You can see here Okay. we have this uh, state recording. And then you will get, um, you'll, you'll send the message in and it'll get some response And what back. is an audio buffer? Is that like a, just a short MP3 file or something else? Yeah, you, you write some code basically to convert the MP3 file into a format um, that the server can understand, right? Okay. So basically you encode it in a specific Okay, got it. Okay, so it's basically encoding the audio file. It's sending yes. it over. And so there's no text happening. Um, so I'm assuming that the main benefit here is latency. Is that yes. right? So when we saw the initial uh, OON demo, right, it was that really fast latency, that 200 milliseconds mm -hmm. uh, latency. Uh, you can actually send text across as well, uh, which is nice. So mm -hmm. with O1, uh, the way that you process the information is you can send text, audio, and in the future, they've talked about sending uh, video as well. Okay. So we have this multimodal approach, uh, and the, the thing that would be interesting is you can combine these different forms of modality, both on input and output, mm -hmm. to generate the results that you want. Uh, it's actually something that they refer to is they say, okay, what, why is text useful, right? So text is useful for moderation. Uh, so they have some moderation as part of the instructions. Okay. And it says right here, real-time API will send text and audio back. So you can use the text to actually check what the response is mm -hmm. to, before sending it back to the user, right? If, let's say if the instructions weren't fully followed or you want to do a reprompt or something. Okay, got it. So the benefit here isn't just voice, um, but it's the fact that you're now processing your text, voice, and eventually video all in the same way. Yes. And so your voice won't have additional latency because mm -hmm. it's trying to go back from text. Um, it should all actually be the same speed. Yes. Okay. And potentially there, you can capture some of that richer information like tone, speed, hmm. uh, sarcasm, what, whatever different elements in natural speech that we have. You can capture it right by the model. And you might even have a prompt that says if the user is being sarcastic, do this, or if they're trying to be funny, or if they're hmm. uh, doing anything really, right? That's really interesting. So like, what does this mean for a lot of the tools that are out there, right? So I think there's uh, tons of, of tools that are built around OpenAI's um, APIs. You have uh, a lot of tools you know, traditionally that did like, make it easy to make, make chatbots. Yeah. Um, now you've got a lot of tools that are making it easy to make like, calling agents. Yes. Um, so what does this mean uh, for those? Is it going to be easier, or is that going to be something that everyone has access to? Yes. Yeah, more. So actually in the demo day, they talked about uh, placing a call uh, to order 400 strawberries, which mm -hmm. is kind of funny. 
Uh, but they did unveil an integration with Twilio. So you still need the, the way to actually connect through a phone system or any yeah. kind of system, whether it's a video call or a phone call. So that's something that's still important. Uh, they also discuss here using tool calling, right? So we can see right here uh, how you can connect to different uh, code bases, right? Or cool. ca ca call the different functions. Uh, but if you still need more control or are writing more complex prompts, mm -hmm. um, it's you still don't have that control necessarily. Uh, you'll have to have something in the middle to, to do something with that text. For example, if you're running your own ML models in between uh, or having some very specific business logic that you can't have the LLM do, uh, that's something that's really important uh, to keep in mind. Okay, and so you would still need. So what this will be useful for is you want to spin up like a voice agent really quickly, yes. maybe with like a core prompt yes. that's guiding it. Um, you can actually access function calling, so it's really useful for uh, a lot of these kind of more simple assistants yes. out of the box. But as soon as you start adding on like that level of complexity of like, okay, let me pull in information from my database about the customer, or let me include business logic around what plan type someone's on, um, a lot of that starts to get really difficult. Yes, yes. Um, but the, the API is great. Like if we if we scroll down, um, there's a lot of great information here and structure. Cool. Um, one of the things I really like is that they published their spec on events. Mm. So uh, we talk a lot about in the voice space interruptions. So if somebody is uh, interrupting, you might want to have specific behavior. Mm. And here they talk about this, right? So they have different events for a conversation turn, uh, changing that input buffer I was talking about, creating a response. Then on the server side, right, there's this whole list of items, right, whether something was interrupted. So oh, they do, do you have a, a good reference page here, uh, yeah. this API reference page of like how things are structured, what, what expected behavior you can have. So it's not just a model API right now. There's just a whole suite of things and behavior you can incorporate. Very cool, very cool. Um, yeah, I think it's pretty interesting because like one thing that uh, at least we started seeing is that as the text model started to get better, as streaming was available, um, as these models got easier to use, you started having a lot of platforms, whether that's like HubSpot, Salesforce, um, kind of like everyone uh, that was now adding on, you know, a basic text agent as a service. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like with this now, what we're gonna start getting is a lot of these services will probably add on like really basic voice agents as a service as well. Yes, uh, and the pricing is kind of interesting. People were, were talking about this uh, online was that the pricing is still relatively expensive compared to, to human, right? Yeah. Uh, sort of the comparison of outsourcing a call center versus using the input output API. Uh, if you do an hour of input and output, it's around $18 yeah. between the $6 for an hour of uh, input and $12 for output. So we'll see how that cost adjusts, right? I'm sure it'll go down over time, as with all other yes, models. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but just interesting the initial pricing, how it's, how it's positioned. Yeah. Um, all right. Cool. Um, awesome. So that's really helpful to know around the uh, like speech to speech side. Mm -hmm. um, I know that like uh, human perception is around 200 milliseconds. Yes. So as long as anything is around that, I don't think it should matter too much. Um, but I think this will be helpful, especially for like the multimodal side. And as um, you know, models get more and more powerful. I know O1 takes a long time to process as well. Yes. So um, any latency on the actual translation side, um, you know, helps overall. Exactly. And during the dev day, they actually had a session talking about building agents and. Mm -hmm talking about latency and other things. So we talk about model latency, but as model latency gets smaller and smaller, we get into things like uh, network latency, mm. right? other application latency, mm. uh, something that becomes more important to consider as you're building these applications. Got it, so just figuring out where is there latency in my application and then figuring out how can I decrease that so yeah. the user isn't um, just you know waiting on the other side. Exactly. Okay, cool, sweet. So that was helpful for the real-time API. I learned a lot from this as well. Um, can we move over to maybe, um, what, what do you think is the most exciting? Of the other three items you mentioned, what do you think is most worthwhile kind of explaining a bit? We'll pick one more. Uh, yeah, so there's, uh, let's go through all of them actually. Two of them are quite short. Uh, so the first one is the, the vision fine tuning. This one is super fast. Basically, you can fine tune vision models right now in okay. uh, their API, so small update. They do have some restrictions, like you can't fine tune on like Humans, mm. uh, faces, What does uh, fine tuning actually mean? Fine, fine tuning is basically giving custom data to a model and yeah. adjusting it so it's better at that task. So you're training the model? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you're training something on top of an existing large language model. So for example, fine tuning GPT for O-mini. Mm -hmm. You take some of your data, you fine tune it, and for that specific task, it should be better. Okay, cool. Yeah. So pretty pretty fast update, but uh, pretty nice. Uh, the, the next one, the bigger one, is prompt caching. So. Mm. Uh, all of the, the major vendors for large language models, uh, Anthropic, uh, 
Google with Gemini have released some kind of form of prompt caching. Okay, and so everybody's a little different. So OpenAI announced theirs. And the way that they structured it is that. And maybe before we get into that, like what is prompt caching? Oh, of course, of course. Uh, right. So prompt caching is basically when you send a request that's yep. quite uh, similar to a previous request, right? You have very similar tokens. Yep. You can actually cache them or store them so mm -hmm. they're more easily available. Uh, so the latency is lower and it's cheaper. Cool. That's like when you go on a website, the website is cached. So the next time you visit it, instead of reloading it again on your yes. server on your side, it just already loaded because it just stores it locally. Exactly, exactly. So uh, the goal of caching is to make things cheaper and faster yeah. for the end user. And it does that by storing some intermediary state of the model response. So cool. we won't get into technical details. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of cool uh, math and computer science behind it. but. The core benefit is things are cheaper and faster. Cool. I ask a question, you give me an answer, you save that answer. If I ask a similar question, you're going to give the same answer. Exactly. Cool. So you can see here in this table, it talks about uh, the pricing. So the input tokens are 50% cheaper uh, for our different models, the latest models that they have released, okay. GPT-40, Mini, and O1. Oh, I see, I see. So like on the uncached token, that's how much you pay normally. Yes. Cash input is like, OK, you've already asked this question. I'm just going to give you the same answer, and yes. so it's cheaper. Exactly. Um, but what's interesting here is that uh, it's automatically cached on prompts longer than 1,024 tokens. Okay. So if you have shorter prompts, it's not necessarily going to be cached. Okay. Uh, so this is an interesting trade-off of having requests that are longer get more benefit than the smaller ones. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, the other interesting part is that the cache lasts between 5 to 10 minutes on average. So uh, this is important is if you have a big application that processes a lot uh, of user data, hmm. you'll benefit from this. But if somebody is going to your app like once a day, you're not going to not really matter. Yeah. OK. Um, now, why I mentioned the other cloud vendors is that everyone has a slightly different approach. Uh, for Google's, uh, for Gemini's, their uh, caching actually works where you pay to store it by the hour. So you almost oh, interesting. have storage costs, yeah, storage costs yeah. for this. Um, but what's interesting is they support multimodal caching, okay. which is really cool. Um, you can see all the different formats here, text, audio, PDF, et cetera. Well, it kind of works in Google's favor too, right? Because they're trying to get you to Google Cloud. So this is like, cool, just pay to store all this for as long as you can. You're paying us anyways. Exactly. So yeah. uh, depending on how many requests you're getting, it really depends hmm. if this model works. The, the other model is uh, Anthropic. Anthropic's model. Uh, so here you actually, in your request, have to specify to cache it. So if we go oh, into this example here, so here they have like the latencies and cost reductions, right? Um, sort of cost reduction up to 90%, latency sort of 30 to 80%. Cool. Uh, and the way they do it is in the request, you say, please cache this request. And then they charge you to write into their cache, mm -hmm. right, to, to store it. And then reading is much cheaper here. So reading the cache is 90% cheaper, for mm -hmm. example, for Sonic 3.5. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, so depending on, I guess, how you want to do it. But realistically, this only matters if you're doing like a high volume, yes. uh, where you know these sense being saved and latency being saved actually matters. So for the majority of people, this won't have an impact. But if you're doing a very high volume agent, high volume um, application, something like this might be really important to think about. Yeah, exactly. And it's very interesting that each of the vendors has chosen a different approach yeah. to solving this problem through through the costing. Cool. Um, all right. Final one that we want to talk about is distillation. So I actually think this is a little bit misleading um, uh, as an announcement. So distillation is the concept of taking a big model, okay. taking its outputs that might be really good, whether it's O1 or GPT-40, compiling a list of good examples, and then fine tuning a smaller model. So this is the concept of distillation, right? You're distilling the ideas from big model into little model. Now, in the announcement here, uh, what they discussed is how you can actually fine tune a smaller model. Uh, but what's new is that they released this way to actually save good examples within the UI. So this is part of their sort of evaluation uh, framework where mm -hmm. you can create test, test data based on the bigger model, uh, sort of store it in the UI. You can see here there's some examples. See the chat completion. Uh, you can run and write tests against it. Cool. So you have various forms of graders. So you have testing criteria, which is really neat. Uh, you can see here there's, I think, nine out of the box, right? Factuality, sentiment, contains information, all this cool stuff. Mm -hmm. And the whole goal is to do this sort of test-driven workflow where you go through, you build an application, you figure out what's working and what's not, you save that, that information, and every time you want to update the model between different versions or creating a new fine-tuned version, you can easily compare how it works. Cool.
Uh, four, four features. I mean, this was a dev release, so I uh, recommend that you go and look at the different APIs, the different documentation. Yeah. Uh, there's also a really cool React Chat version of the real-time API. Oh, yes. I was playing around with that yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's super cool. So out of these four releases, go go give them a look and let us know if you have any questions. Uh, and yeah. If there's anything you want to learn more about, like any of these four releases that we didn't dive in deep enough, like distillation, uh, just comment below, and then maybe Dennis and I will do another explainer session on it. All right. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us.